My guest today is a sort of a move from my team to set me up a little bit for a failure. A bit of politics, a bit of philosophy, a bit of human rights, one of the best in the world at it. My guest today is uh, Tom Palmer. I think we've had a very long period of increasing human liberty. I do think that the aggregate shows that over about the last 15 years, there's been a decline in the human experience of liberty. There's another element that we overlooked for a long time, and that is threats to relative status. You mean your position within society? Not relative to where I was before, but relative to you. Yes, uh, emerging technologies can be scary, but we're much better off having social pluralism, freedom of speech. I don't have to be a member of this religious group to favor their equal freedom. Their freedom is connected to mine at a deep, deep level. Welcome back. Uh, my guest today uh, is a sort of a move mo from my team to set me up a little bit for a failure. I'll, I'll tell you why. Uh, because of everything that's happening in the world today, my team suggested that we uh, have a conversation around a bit of politics, a bit of philosophy, a bit of human rights, and really uh, try to understand where our world is. These are topics that I'm passionate about, I understand nothing about. So uh, they recommended one of the best in the world at it. My guest today is uh, Tom Palmer, who is an influential libertarian, who uh, is an author, a theorist, who played a key role in advocating liberty in Eastern Europe, sort of post-Cold War, and is active trying to bring liberal values to the Middle East. He is the uh, author of multiple influential publications on the topic. He is uh, holding senior roles in the Cato Institute, a senior fellow. He is the vice president uh, for, the, for international programs at Atlas Networks. He is basically traveling the world, has been to North Korea, to Afghanistan, and so on, with an approach to understand the world, but also to uh, to spread uh, liberty. So uh, we're poised for a, a very interesting conversation today uh, because I'm totally ignorant, but very, very keen. Uh, Tom is also known to be a wonderful human being. So a lot of people uh, that know him have sort of told me in the background of how uh, inclusive, how respectful and how um, aligned with his, with his mission he is. Uh, so if I appear to, to be ignorant, ignore me because our guest really knows what he's talking about. Uh, Tom, I am really grateful that you're here today. I think you heard my intro. So uh, um, allow me to have the curiosity of a child, if, if that's okay. Uh, I think we both aligned when we were talking before we started recording that the most important thing for a human life is to really add value. And I, I want to start by saying, um, I think our world is going in a very interesting direction. It's, uh, I sense that some things are getting better, but a lot of things are getting worse. I may be wrong. Uh, so I want to start by asking your views on liberty. Uh, do you think we're heading into a world that is more liberal or more oppressive? Well, uh, that's the big question. Let me start, though, by thanking you for, I think, the the kindest introduction I've ever received in my oh, life. Oh, that true? Okay. I had, I had many more points that I was able to to, 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 to include, but I didn't. But the, the other element was professing one's ignorance is the beginning of wisdom. And I don't mean that as just a cliché. It's important to recognize the limits of our own knowledge. I don't know how to run your life. You have all kinds of experiences and issues and problems and challenges and skills. I don't know anything about. And we should recognize that's true of everybody, even people sometimes we think are very close to us. There are things yeah. about them we don't know, things they know that we don't know. And I think that recognition is the beginning of a kind of social, political, legal relationship that's respectful of other people. We start out not by saying, I know so much. Some people do know things. When I have a legal question, I talk to a lawyer. When I have a mathematical question, I might talk to a mathematician or a physicist yeah. and so on. So there is authority, but there's also respect. Everybody has some authority about something. Uh, so then this deep question, 
Uh, I think we've had a very long period of increasing human liberty. It, you know, zigs and zags, there are down periods, and it's a big world, so different things are happening in different places. I do think that the aggregate shows that over about the last 15 years, there's been a decline in the human experience of liberty. Now, to someone who's 20 years old, that's like all of history. Yeah. Uh, to someone my age, it's a it's a bad spell, but most of the time before that saw incremental rise in liberty and in respect for human rights. So the long term, over the course of my life, has generally been positive in terms of the aggregate number of people experiencing liberty and human rights. The short term, it's been negative. And I think that liberal principles have been on the back foot that we've seen various kinds of uh, angry uh, populism and um, uh, uh, racism and nihilism and violence for its own sake uh, rising in various parts of the world. Uh, we've also seen something that I didn't expect to see. It really was a, a surprise, but I think uh, we have to realize it's happening and that is after the decline of the Soviet Union, its collapse. So I was active in that region before the, the Cold War had ended, and then after. Uh, we thought, many people thought, well, liberal ideas have triumphed in this idea of live and let live and democratic governance. Unfortunately, particularly in Russia, the ideas of the 1930s and 40s came back. I did not expect to see this in my lifetime. But ideas we thought had been buried in 1945 are very much back. The idea that our nation is better than yours, we have a right to conquer you, you are subservient, yeah. or sub you, so on, this kind of language. And so that the Russian state under Putin, and I don't speak of Russians, I have many, many dear Russian friends, but I have to say all of them are out of Russia now. Yeah. They find it unbearable to live there. Yeah. The Russian state has become a real center of any kind of illiberalism, left wing, right wing. Therefore, all of them, so long as liberalism, this idea of live and let live and tolerate, one person lives one way, another another way, one goes to this church, mosque, temple, and so on. Uh, it is now a center that is propagating this into the rest of the world. Yeah. Then you add to that the coalition that they have with the extreme mullahs in Iran, the Iranian state, the Red Communist Party of China, and then their various proxies around the world. And I think that we are in a, a global struggle for liberal democracy. It is really under attack, and not just in the isolated cases. Many of these are connected, yeah. one with it. And to respond to that, I think people have to sit back and say, am I just going to let our democratic institutions be destroyed? Or am I going to do something about it? Am I going to be swept up in waves of rage and anger, which is what populist politicians tend to feed on? Or am I going to try to be more rational and ask what kind of world do I want my children to inherit? What kind of institutions? How do I want them to be treated? And how do I want them to learn how to treat others? So the challenge is enormous at the moment. 100%, yeah. And I think it's a... It's a a turning point. Do, do, do you think that this is only the result of political agendas? Is it is it is it the idea that if the political leadership uh, would sort of divide us, uh, get us to argue, uh, you know, uh, get us to hate each other, then they'd have an easier uh, path to ruling? Or is there something that's happening in society as well that's making us? sort of, you know, disrespect the rights of the other person? Yes. Well, that's the million dollar question. I think it's both. But let's turn to the, the easy one is to say, oh, it's a strategy by politicians. Yeah. And, and I think that's true. 
but why is it working now and it didn't work as well 30 years ago? Well, yeah. What has changed? Yeah. And I think that there are a few things we can look to for that. And one is rapid change in society is scary to many people. And we've seen tremendous transformations around the world that have been extremely rapid. And so to take an example, there's a political psychologist, very data-driven, named Karen Stenner. And she's done a lot of work on uh, looking at psychological attitudes, polling data, all kinds of empirical data about what motivates authoritarianism. There was a theory going back to the 40s and 50s of the last century that there was an authoritarian personality that came out. That those people were responsible. And she said, you know, that's not true. There's no evidence for that. All of us are potentially authoritarian. <laughs> if we're triggered, all yeah. of us, everybody. Uh, there are ways to trigger an authoritarian response. So the first one is a threat to my survival. If you threaten my group with extinction, we're going to coalesce around the, the, the warlord who's going to save us, and we'll defer to that authority. So there's that. But there's another element that we overlooked for a long time, and I'm guilty of this. It was a blind spot. And that is threats to relative status. And I think this has been happening in much of the world. So let me explain. You mean your position within society? Relative to others, not relative to where I was before, but um, relative to you. And, and that's happening everywhere. Yeah. Well, everywhere, but I think more rapidly in surprising ways. So let's take the United States, uh, where I lived for a long time. Um, John Kennedy the former president, said something very wise. It's an easy-to-remember slogan. A rising tide lifts all boats. So if you're becoming better off, it doesn't mean I have to be worse off. I can become better off as well. So a rising tide of prosperity can make everyone better off. So our absolute positions, we can all improve. It's not a zero-sum game where your increase came at my expense. I had to fall by an equivalent amount. However, when it comes to our relative status, that's not the case. So let's imagine a group of 100 people, and we rank them in terms of their popularity. Take an easy one. Who's the most popular person? Number one is the, uh, we'll say, 100, most popular person in the group, 99, 98, all the way down to me. I'm the least popular person. Nobody <laughs> that very me. much. Even I don't like myself. I'm right at the bottom. Now, if somebody rises in that ranking, somebody else had to fall. Correct. That's not true if we become healthier, wealthier, wiser, richer, and so on. We can all rise. But if it's relative status, a pecking order, if you will, someone rising means someone falls. So if you look, just take the United States as an example, but it's not unique in this way. Um, over the past 40 years or so, a lot of people who had been low in social status rose. African Americans, an obvious example. Then there was an African American president. That's the kind of pinnacle of social, political uh, prestige, number one uh, position. Uh, women, the women heads of corporations, secretary of state, vice president, possibly president shortly, and so on. Immigrants of all sorts. Uh, let's think about Muslim immigrants. Uh, 50 years ago, very few Americans had seen a Muslim. Now, it's your neighbor, it's the person you meet at the checkout counter, it's your doctor, it's the person working on your car, it's, it's people all around you. So from a low status, they're now integrated into society, their status rose. Well, somebody's had to fall if it's a pecking order status. And who was that? Well, the evidence is pretty clear. White men who have high school degrees or below. Mm. So white men with college degrees, they did okay. Mm. But white men without college degrees felt a great loss of respect. They fell in social status. 
And this is reflected in a lot of popular culture. For example, something that I wince every time I hear it. If in American television or movies, you want to portray someone as not very bright, dumb, backwards, primitive. Well, let's take stereotypes of human beings. You're not going to pick a person of color. That's going to get you in a lot of hot water and trouble. You're not going to uh, pick a religious minority and so on. That's going to cause difficulties. You pick a white guy with a rural accent. And the rural accent means not smart. Hmm. And it turns out people with rural accents resent that. Who knew that they would resent <laughs> being and humiliated yeah. in many different parts of popular culture? They do. They feel that disrespect. And I think that this has engendered an um, anger uh, in politics, a sense that they're under attack, that their position is threatened. And it, I think, accounts for much of the Trump phenomenon. Of course. In the United States. Not everything, but it's, it's a major factor. Uh, one of the biggest predictors of someone being an active Trump supporter was their answer to the question, do people care about what people like you think? And those who said no, are that's a very strong predictor of being an enthusiastic Trump backer, which means no one cares about me. I fell on status. Yeah. So that's a question that we need to address. Uh, it's also true in Europe. It's true in some other societies also. How to help people to regain their dignity and self-respect without coming at the expense of others. What happens is that if I feel a loss of social status, I try to bring the other person down so that I don't feel uh, deprived of my rights, sort of. And my way of doing that is to try and take away their rights. Is that how it works? That's one form that that can take. And I think that's something we have absolutely seen in uh, contemporary politics. I mean, I mean, look at uh, Germany, the AFD party, Alternative für Deutschland, is currently in a great deal of hot water. When it came out, they had a secret conference with some really scary totalitarian neo-Nazi type figures about deporting non-Germans from Germany. And they define non-German to include German citizens. Oh, wow. But, uh, but of the wrong skin color or ethnic background. Of course, yeah. This is, this is quite scary. And there's a, a need, I think, for everyone to achieve an identity. And you've done it with your work and your, your career as an engineer and entrepreneur, and now with your uh, uh, work spreading this idea of people struggling to achieve happiness. Your identity is tied up in that. There's another way to get an identity, not only through your achievements and your accomplishments, but by saying, I'm not that, the, the oh, wow. negative yes. route to an identity. Mm -hmm. And so someone might say, well, and I don't want to use any of the hateful negative terms, but I'm not gay, but they would use a nastier term. I'm not a queer mm -hmm. or something like that. I'm not black. Well, that's what the N word is for. I'm not that. And they achieve a kind of an identity in that fashion. It's a negative identity. It's what you're not. Hmm. But it's an easy way to achieve one, much easier than actually going and accomplishing something. So I'll give you a, a simple personal experience. Many years ago, um, uh, talking to my brother, who was working as a janitor at the time and putting his, his way through college. <clears throat> And uh, he and I have similar views on uh, political matters. And he was, like I was, very enthusiastic. This was many decades ago. And he gave leaflets to his co-workers, who were mu much, much older than he was. And then he, a few days later, he said, oh, did you read that? And one of them was very sullen and taciturn, didn't say anything. And another janitor said, well, he can't read. Mm. And my brother, being young and 
a little bit naive about these things, said, oh, well, immediately he thought, there are literacy courses for adults that you could enroll in and so on. This is not something that a, a grown adult wants to hear from a very young person. And his response was, well, maybe I can't read, but at least I'm not a, and then he uttered that hateful N-word. Yeah. And that's a way of negating the existence of other people and affirming your own in, in this negative fashion. And so saying I'm not, whatever the outgroup is, is an easy way to achieve a cheap identity. I'm one of us. Now you can add another element. There is a political theory called populism. There was a particularly badly written book by Ernesto Laclau, <laughs> who is a uh, now deceased, but a, a political scientist from Argentina, then taught in the UK, called Unpopulist Reason. And he said that you create the people by identifying the enemies of the people. Yeah. What is the fundamental unit of politics in his view? It's not a principle, which is what the more liberal approach would be, principles of toleration and, and rule of law. It's a demand. I want something. And a political leader assembles demands, and he creates a unity among them. They have no coherence in and of themselves by positing the enemy, the enemy of the people. And the enemy of the people can be anyone you choose. It can be Muslims or Jews or Christians. It can be homosexuals or immigrants. It can be the 1% or whatever. Anyone who's not like you. Well, such that we can then create an identity of the true people hmm. versus the enemy of the people. And his, his language is particularly opaque. I think people who have something nasty to say sometimes deliberately occluded in clouds of additional words. He says that what provides the unity is the empty signifier. And I puzzled over the book so much, and I realized, oh, he means Mussolini. <laughs> That's the empty signifier mm. who creates unity by designating the enemy of the people. Hmm. Laclau was a Peronist. Peron was the Argentine yeah. dictator. and But, uh, but he, he created a general roadmap for populists. And so you hear that language, the enemy of the people. Donald Trump uses that term. They are the enemy of the people. And any time I hear that phrase, my blood just runs cold. Hmm. But isn't, isn't, that, isn't that now becoming... I mean, as you, as you speak about it, isn't that becoming the nature of social media that, you know, I'm not like you is my identity, but that, that's, that's not driven by an agenda, right? It's like almost everyone is trying to become not like everyone else to find their identity. There is no coherence among them. It's not like I'm like, I'm not like you, but I'm like that other person. It's like, I'm not like anyone. I'm not sure about that. Mm. Um, it, it's I'm not a social scientist who's studied social media and the big picture with lots of aggregate data. Uh, my experience on Twitter, X, threads, and so on. Yes, there are some people who just assert that, but there's a lot of angry denunciation and hatred and siloization. My friends, and I, this is a, a problem I have, I tried to overcome it. Mm. I'm more likely to be friends with people who agree with me on things. It's sort of natural. You have those common points. And I try to seek out people who don't agree with me. They're of more course. interesting anyway. These, these are the interesting ones, yeah. And I learn, I'm going to learn from them. Correct. So when I, I read magazines, I read some that I generally find aligned with my views, but I read a number that I know I'm going to disagree with it. Mm. Maybe it'll spark something in me that I'll see, oh, I see why they think that. And maybe there's something even to it. That's the harder part, but to be open to being wrong. But when we end up in these silos, or echo chambers rather, I just hear my own views bounce back at me all the time. Correct. And then we expel those who disagree with us. They're driven out. You, they're insulted, attacked, 
well, and it doesn't matter what cult is doing it. You would, the, any political trend or social or religious or what have you is going to expel people. And it's hard to find places where people say, well, hold on, let, let me think about what you just said. Yeah. So, so, so the most interesting bit is that now from a tech point of view, the algorithm expels them as well, right? So, you know, on the, on the, on the Palestine, uh, um, Israel conflict that's, you know, still raging and tens of thousands of kids being killed, you know, nobody's talking about the topic of please stop killing the kids. Uh, everyone is talking about the topic of who's right and who's wrong. And, you know, if you ask any side of the conversation, they'll simply say, you see, the world is now starting to believe my point of view. All of the reels on Instagram are talking about my point of view. The, re the reason is that Instagram shows you what you want to see. They just don't show you the other guy, correct? That's right. And so, and so now we're almost designing the nature of the conversation so that you think that you're right, so that you get that affirmation and you, be be you believe that you're more right. The, I think that's a big issue, these echo chambers. And then the one who disagrees, you respond angrily. It's so easy yeah. to respond with an angry, screw you, go to hell, drop dead. It's much yeah. easier than engaging someone and saying, I see, I see the strength of your argument, but I think it's overlooked such and such. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. hard to write in a tweet. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, you know, it's even more interesting. I attempted to correct that on my social media by putting a few reels on the topic is that if there is someone that you believe is not from your cult and that someone is dispensing incredible wisdom, right? Whatever, you know, like it, it's undeniably incredibly valuable and correct. Okay. You still, you still refuse it and react to it angrily because you've categorized that person as the enemy of the people. And so whatever the enemy of the people says is wrong. It, it just doesn't matter. Uh, I'm not even going to listen to it to verify if it's correct or not. No, this is exactly right. And this is observable in political psychology. It's epistemic tribalism. Mm. I believe things because they're what my tribe believes, not because I have any other reason to believe it, mm. but it's the belief of my tribe. And then in addition, something that I've experienced, and, and I admit you have to work at overcoming it, and I'm not perfect, I'm sure I fail many times, is to assume that someone who doesn't agree with me is evil, hmm. has bad motives. It's very yeah. easy to do. And then if someone has bad motives, why would I want to listen to? They're just going to lie to me. Yeah. Why would you listen to the devil? Yeah. The devil is going to try and deceive you. And so you shut them down. So I'll take an example that uh, I've struggled with for many years. So I have a background in, in economics also, and there are unintended consequences to human behavior. Your intention or my intention may be wonderful, but that's not the same as the consequences. We might make things worse. We might screw things up with bad policies. So good intentions, I like them, but I don't care about them that much. I'm much more interested in good outcomes and good consequences. Well, we'll take an issue that uh, economists are almost universally negative on imposing minimum wage rates. Mm. They unemploy people on the margin. It's usually people less skilled, less experienced, younger, marginalized outsiders, they get unemployed. And the logic is pretty simple. At $14 an hour, someone will be unemployed. But if you say $14, why not make it 20? Why be so cheap? Well, why not 25, 30, 60? Well, at some point, I'd lose my job. And everybody starts to get that if you do the thought experiment. At $100 an hour, I wouldn't be hired, right? So there's someone at $16 an hour, probably a young person or a person struggling with the language or without skills and so on. But if you mention that, people who support minimum wage are often likely to say, you don't like poor people. Hmm. That's what's going on here. You're against poor people. 
So I heard just recently on the radio in the United States um, that the minimum wage had been raised in a number of states. And the and the, the newscaster said people are getting a wage rise in those states. As well, some, but some are probably losing their jobs. There's a reason why when you go to a McDonald's or a fast food place, there are those automatic ordering things yeah. rather than a team. The consequence is that people will say, no, I'm not going to listen to you. You're against the poor. And because you're against the poor, I won't listen to you because you're a bad person. And so the argument that has convinced virtually all economists falls on deaf ears with most other people. Yeah. And... It, it's a problem to sit down and say, okay, I'm, let me start with the assumption you're, you're not a bad person. Mm. So let me think through your argument. You might be wrong. I might disagree. I might find a hole in your argument. But I'm not going to start by saying you're a bad person, and therefore I won't listen to you. I, I think that single change alone would change the world. Honestly, I mean, if people just simply change their mind and say, wisdom is wisdom, even if it comes from someone who's bad. And by the way, someone who's not like me is not always bad. Uh, you know, that justification of if they're not like me, then they must be bad. That's, I think, a, 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 a game of ego, which basically is what you started the conversation with. By making someone else look worse than they are, I look better than I am. Right. That's right. And, and, and I think I think that whole uh, uh, attachment to wanting to look better than you are or wanting to relatively retain a position uh, is where we all fall into hate is where we all fall into, uh, you know, dividing uh, us and them and, and basically working against each other which is very dangerous when you think about it. C can, I, can I ask you before we, we try to sure. think of what's possible here? Where do you think we're going? Uh, so so my, my theory, unfortunately, uh, you know, because of my work in technology, is that the world is about to become a bit more dangerous because of uh, the prolification of uh, what used to be restricted to nation states. So, you know, in the past, you, you needed very significant budget to build a weapon, let's say. And now, you know, I think there was an incredible story about the Ukrainian resistance at the early uh, start of the, of, the, uh, of the Russian invasion where 30 techies with drones that were loaded with explosives were able to actually, you know, halt the, the march of the, of the Russian tanks at the beginning, right? And, and, and so, you know, whether it comes to technology, to AI, to, uh, you know, to synthetic biology, and so on, there seems to be a lot more control that's going to be needed to be applied by the nation state so that we can actually stay safe, sort of. And the more control, the more we take away liberty, correct? So, so in, a, in a very interesting way, you're going to be presenting the people of the future of with two with two options. Option one is, hey, w w everyone can walk the streets, no surveillance, no issues. But if someone bad starts to do something, it's going to hurt everyone. Or hey, submit to my uh, uh, to my control and surveillance and 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 you know restriction so that I can keep all of you safe. Okay, that's a very scary future in my mind. W w where do you think we're going? That's the one that's being offered in many cases. The Chinese Communist Party already makes this an explicit offer. We yeah. monitor and watch you every place all the time, but you're safe. And you get to have uh, games on Weibo, just as long as you're not critical of Xi Jinping <laughs> or, yes. or the Communist Party and so on. But you can have a superficial life so long as you don't step out of line, so long as you don't practice Islam. So long as you don't practice Christianity, so long as you are not in a religious movement that might threaten the monopoly of the Communist Party, and so on. <clears throat> but it's a false bargain. You actually end up being less safe under those circumstances. So it's true that the proliferation and decentralization of technology can have scary aspects. 
But that's true of lots of other technologies in the past. Allowing these things to emerge and then trying to come up with standards for governance of them within a democratic framework is much safer in the long run than succumbing to a dictatorship like that of the Communist Party. And we even saw, even when it came to COVID, for example, uh, the Chinese Communist Party asserted, we, we, our hand, they locked up huge numbers of people and with real brutal force. Yeah. Some of the lockdowns I think uh, we saw in Europe and North America were, were scary and unjustified. But they were very mild compared to what the Chinese experienced, of being literally fenced in, not allowed to leave buildings and so on. And it was a failure. It was a simple failure. As it turned out, this technology that got out, I'm not talking about the COVID virus, wherever it came from. I'm talking about the vaccines, the mRNA vaccines. Astonishing uh, change in the world. We have Hungarian-born biochemist who gets the Nobel Prize, who struggled for years as an outsider, laughed at. She was the one who was the co-inventor of this technology. And then two Turkish-born German scientists who set up a company, and they figure out in a very short period of time, using computation, how to defeat the virus. Then working with the Greek president of a major pharmaceutical company who was trained as a veterinarian. So this global community of scientists and entrepreneurs created vaccines and rolled them out. And then they were made available uh, around the world. Um, I was in uh, Thailand, which got them a bit late because of some poor policy decisions by the government here. They said, we have a monopoly in vaccines. And when other people were being vaccinated, no one in Thailand was. Yeah. Because they didn't get around to, to getting any. Social pressure built up, and finally they relented. And, and frankly, the business community said, we will pay for the vaccines, which is what they did on Phuket and Koh Samui. They said, we'll vaccinate everyone at our own expense because we can't be shut down like this anymore. This turned out to be a much more robust approach, saved a lot more lives than the Communist Party centralized dictatorial approach. And I think that's a general model for the world. Yes, uh, emerging technologies can be scary. Uh, they will have consequences that you and I cannot now imagine. But we're much better off having social pluralism, freedom of speech, freedom to criticize, to ask questions, uh, yeah. freedom of movement, uh, freedom of trade, and free democratic conversation. It's a more robust response to those problems. So I'll give you an example of things that, that change social life in ways that were hard to anticipate. The telephone, mm. the ability to talk to people far away and for lovers to have long conversations uh, with each other, though, despite being separated. Uh, it used to be the case in uh, middle class, yeah. the wealthier homes, that you went courting and there was a parlor in the house. And there the boy and the girl could sit and talk, supervised by chaperones. Yeah. That was the dating experience. Yeah. Well, the automobile sure changed that, the automobile and the telephone. And now all kinds of other socialization, including romantic socialization with telephone, text messaging, apps, Tinder, Grindr, all those sorts of things. And these have consequences. Some we might applaud, some we might regret. They're often unintended, but they have responses. People emerge with, more res with better solutions rather than having a tech dictator telling us when and how we're allowed to use this technological improvement or not. So, so if you were to, to think of the future, uh, I mean, from our conversation so far, there has been a decline in the last 20 years in liberties in general, 
Uh, this is not restricted to the dic dictatorships of the world. This also happens, uh, you know, in every part of the world because of social mobility and the relative positioning of people. Uh, it seems more and more that it is divide and conquer that if you're not like me, you're the enemy. And, you know, I can, I can get an identity by being rude to the enemy, being violent to the enemy. Uh, this seems to me as a very dangerous future, if you even add to it a bit of the nation state control and so on and so forth. What is the answer? I mean, what's, what, is the answer a push for democracy? Is it at the political level? Uh, you know, I think my question is two sides. You know, what should the people do? Hmm? You and I and everyone listening, but also how should we use technology so that technology not only makes us, I mean, that doesn't work against us because I think also there is a wave of technology really getting into disinformation and misinformation and really not telling us the truth anymore. So, and without truth, there is no liberty. There are a couple of questions embedded in that that I think could be teased out. And the first one, a little bit uncomfortable for me because for my adult life, I have been what I would consider a peace activist, and I still consider myself a peace activist. War is terrible, and you should do virtually anything to avoid it. When it's brought to you, you 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 were not able to avoid it. Yeah. And I think that we are at a time when I believe in a strong military response to a heinous aggression. So I was just in Ukraine about 10 days ago and uh, working with Ukrainians. Uh, most of my work is on humanitarian relief and helping them get ambulances and field hospitals. The suffering has been quite extraordinary yeah. there. And you see that the, the Russian army destroys everything. If they can't take it or steal it, they destroy it. If I can't have it, you won't have it is the, the mentality of the state there. And so I'm very strongly supportive of the Ukrainians being able to defend themselves. They don't want to conquer Russia. They don't want to take any Russia. They just want not to be conquered, invaded, annexed, and then have the knock on the door at night because your daughter was heard speaking Ukrainian, <clears throat> not to have all the books in the library taken out and burned, because they're in Ukrainian language and then replaced by Russian, not have the local town council members disappear, or in the case of Crimea, the Tatar population has been decimated now by the Russians. Uh, they killed their top leaders, they disbanded their majlis, their, uh, their, their parliament, yeah. uh, and so on. And so I think that I'm very strongly supportive of the Ukrainians being able to fight back. But it's not just Ukraine. If Ukraine falls, the dictatorship in Moscow is an aggressive dictatorship. It really is borrowing from the 1930s and 40s, from the page book. And they will attack more states. And then they are trying, when I say they, I mean Putin and Shoigu and Lavrov and this clique at the top in Russia, the October 7 attack, I believe, was very strongly supported by the Kremlin as well as by the Tehran regime, knowing exactly what was going to happen afterwards. And the suffering and the destruction and the tens of thousands of people, this was known. Then the Venezuelan uh, threat to invade Guyana, and then the attacks on shipping, in the Red Sea, and there are going to be more of these. Yes. So I think at one level, a military response is appropriate, not to send soldiers to Ukraine, but to send the resources for the Ukrainians to defend themselves. And I have known people who have already lost their lives uh, in Ukraine defending themselves, and uh, people whose family members have been killed by Russian occupiers. I've met, went to recently liberated villages and women came out just to talk to someone, what they experienced. 
One said her son had been executed, taken out and shot by the Russian occupiers. And then the unspoken element for uh, many of the women was the experience of uh, sexual assault and gang rape uh, as well. Uh, so I do believe that we need that support of the Ukrainian struggle, and I'm very strongly in favor of that. Then the second question is, how do we support the institutions of liberal democracy, a pluralistic society, one that has a space for people, regardless of their religion or creed or color or language and so on, that says, you have a life to lead. You can lead your life too, but we need some common rules that make that possible. Rule of law, toleration, and so on. I think that we need to step back and focus on exactly that, on rules, on the constitutions, the constitutional order. So not just in the United States, Americans are very proud of their constitution for good reasons, I think. Not perfect, and it's been amended to make it better over time, but it's done a pretty good job. But other countries have constitutions, even unwritten ones like Great Britain has an unwritten constitution but people know what it is. Uh, focus on the Constitution and not on the policy outcomes you prefer. And that's a very mm -hmm. important thing. It, it's a little hard for me. I, I mentioned the issue of the minimum wage. Um, I think minimum wage laws are a bad idea. They make poor people unemployed. That doesn't help them. However, I would not support someone who said, I'll be your dictator and I'll get rid of the minimum wage or whatever, it is, legalization of marijuana. I'm very strongly in favor of legalizing pot. I don't smoke it. I don't like it. I don't want to be around it. But I don't want people to go to prison for owning a plant. <laughs> but I wouldn't support someone who said, look, I'm the pro-pot dictator. Put me in absolute power and I'll legalize pot, which is what you want. Well, what I also want is not just this outcome, I want the system of rules that generates outcomes, and that's constitutional respect. Even if, let's say, you and I run for office, and we Never campaign hard. Well, imagine, <laughs> it's a thought experiment. Yeah. We run for the same office, dog catcher or state senator or a member of parliament or whatever. And you get more votes than I do. I'm supposed to say, congratulations. We fought a tough campaign and I criticized you, but I congratulate you. And now I become the loyal opposition. And I'll criticize you and I'll ask hard questions and I'll be tough on you. But I will respect that you are the one who has the office. And by the way, office comes from the Latin term for a duty. Yeah. When you get office, you don't get power, you get a duty. A responsibility. And now that's in your hands, and I respect that. And that is what we have missed in the United States. Mr. Trump said, whatever you think of his policies, before the election, he said, it's already rigged, and I, and I refuse to accept that that horrible person could ever win. Well, that's just an invite. That is what leads to dictatorship, in my opinion. Just yeah. that. And we need to be able to say, we followed the rules. I may not be happy with the outcome. I got my less preferred outcome. But what is more important to me is the process by which the outcome was generated. I pre-warned at the beginning of our conversation that I know nothing about this. Uh, so so I'm, I'm going to ask the most maybe naive or stupid question you probably ever received. So, so your belief is still in governance. I don't believe in government at all. Uh, so so I, 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 you know, in, uh, in my culture, there is some proverb, I think it's a religious saying, but it basically says, as you are, so will your, your leader. Okay. Which in my mind is, uh, uh, is is actually where the core of the issue is. The core of the issue is that if the people don't change and expect that government and rules and laws and regulations and so on will put them in place, uh, yeah, there is a chance of success, but 
it's unlikely going to be the case if the people are rude to each other, if the people take away the liberty of the enemy, if the people, is there a way? I mean, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe if we tell people, I mean, I remember a time in my country, Egypt, where there was a, a head of, of the police that basically said, you know what? From now on, there is no go, not going to be jaywalking. There is not going to be breaking the, the you know, running through traffic lights and so on. And literally within a month, everyone complied. And, you know, the streets were so much more smooth and everything was wonderful. But eventually what ended up happening is, as you are, so you will be, so will be your leader. He was kicked out and, you know, and things went back to normal, right? And if you've ever been to Egypt, I'm sure you have, you know, the, the, there is, you know, traffic lights are sort of like guidelines. If, you know, if you wanna stop, it's, 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 it's decoration really, you know, it's all about uh, negotiating who crosses the, 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 the crossroads, right? And, and, and so it's quite interesting in my mind that we, by, by us expecting to get governance to work, we're sort of letting go of our own responsibility of us shaping up so that we get the leader that matches a shaped up people. Well, there are a lot of deep issues involved in that. I know. <laughs> when it comes to the first question about believing in government, that word, to that term to believe in is equivocal. That is to say, you can use it in at least two different ways. Believe in means I put my faith in it, or believe in means I think they exist. <laughs> Start with the second one. Yes. So they're out it's, there. Like, it's like I believe there is a God. I believe there is a government. Yeah. Be believe it or not, I actually don't believe there is a government. I believe there is a bunch of politicians that are hungry, that are following a system to get into power, and that this system is so antiquated that it is actually not functional at all. And because it's 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 dysfunctional, and because they have to play it to get to their power, they sort of reinforce it in a way that's becoming more and more dysfunctional. There, there needs to be a reset, in my view. Be careful about resetting things. I know. <laughs> uh, it's it's like a mutation. Most mutations turn out not to be favorable to the survival of the creature, or they're irrelevant to it. It's only a few that turn out to have advantages. And evolutionary process is those that have some advantage reveal themselves. The, the plant or the animal is more likely to survive and have more offspring and so on. So if, if I were to say, you know, we need a reset, I'm going to irradiate you and cause a lot of mutations in your genetic material, that's probably not going to come turn out well. It might. We might irradiate you in some way that would allow you to do cool things like glow in the dark when you want to or <laughs> yeah. things like that. But probably, almost certainly, it's going to be negative. Mm. So we have to be careful about the resets that we ask for. Uh, now, the, then the other question is, um, we do have governments. They're yeah. out there. They're states. So they're not people. The, the government is not a big person. It's not a creature or an animal or something like that. It's made up of people, as you mentioned, politicians, but also filing clerks and uh, uh, meter maids and people who write tickets and tax collectors and it's everybody and all of their complex relationships. So it's a thing. It's an entity in some sense, like a chess club. A chess club isn't just a bunch of individuals. It's individuals who come together in a relationship. They have a function. They like to play chess. They, they elect the secretary and the chair who then decides when the meetings will be held and so on. So we can speak meaningfully of a chess club. It's not just a heap of people. Yeah, It's an entity of a kind made up of people and their relationships. And governments are like that too. And those institutions, those entities, can cause enormous suffering and harm in the world. When they go bad, they're really, really, really bad. Exactly. But here we are. How can we make them less bad and possibly adding some value to the world? So for that, I think we need to actively embrace some principles of liberal democracy. So I'll give you an example of a dear friend of mine who died in uh, 2014. Some suggested possibly poisoned by Mr. Putin because he was a critic, but 
he also was in poor health. His name was Kacha Ben Dukidza. He was a genius businessman. Uh, he was a biochemist in the Soviet Union, very high level, brilliant scientist. And as the Soviet Union collapsed, he said, well, I set up a company in biochemistry to develop uh, anti B, anti anti venom for bee stings. But one of his colleagues stole all the bee venom. And as he said, you know how many bees it takes to get a liter of bee venom? Uh, so it was a disaster. And then he went into other businesses, became very prosperous. And then uh, when Putin began to create his dictatorship, he said, we don't need people like you. And he was Georgian ethnically. Georgians fell out of favor. They deported them from Russia in cargo planes, by the way, to indicate they were trash. Wow. And he became Minister of Economics of, of Georgia for basically a dollar a year. And he began to reform the state uh, with the government there. He said, what do you want? They said, we want to be independent of Russia. He said, then make Georgia rich. How do you do that? He said, here are some things. The police there were so corrupt. They were probably the most corrupt of the post-Soviet states, which is saying a lot. Yeah. They were just bandits. They would just steal from you. People had two wallets, the bribe wallet with just enough that they wouldn't beat you, and then the real wallet that mm -hmm. you would hide. And what Kaka did is he said, okay, we're firing them. He just fired all of them in one day. He said, go home, do something else. Then they hired a much smaller police force. They gave them different uniforms and they, different cars that were painted differently. And then they had police trainers from, you know, Denmark and other countries to give police training how, how to arrest a drunk driver without beating him to death, which was an important skill that the previous police didn't understand. But that's something you need to learn how to do. I don't know how to arrest a drunk driver and stop him from hurting people. You need training for that. So they did that. And then they went to all the police stations and they dynamited them. No they way. blew them up. They destroyed them. And they built new ones made entirely of glass. Hmm. So when the police, these new policemen, who had no previous police experience but were trained by European and Canadian and so on officers, if they arrest me, they take me in, all my friends can see. And everyone was now having cell phones with cameras. So if they begin to beat me, it's on video. It created a totally different dynamic, and the police changed. They changed so much so that if a policeman was approaching you, you, you no longer immediately felt fear, which is what you experienced before. Uh, that was a huge improvement, and it came about by thinking carefully, what are the incentives that people face? Why do they engage in bad behavior? How can we change the, the, the context of that behavior, the incentives economists talk about, uh, and transparency, literal transparency, was one of the ways to do that. Yeah. Uh, and so that was an improvement. And it's one I'm happy to say I knew the people who were behind it, and it worked. Now, Georgia's had other problems uh, since that time, but the um, results that they brought about, many of them have been lasting. Yeah. And it's been just astonishing improvement. So I'll take that. I'm happy it, to get those kinds of improvements. It, it always takes one leader, doesn't it? Just a leader. I don't think that's true. Actually, it takes something more. And I was at a conference I organized in 2014 with Kaka in Ukraine, uh, immediately with the invasion, the Russian invasion. It didn't start in 2022. It's been going on for 10 years now. Um but the we organized an emergency summit in Ukraine, uh, Kaha and I, and he was going to be up to be in the cabinet as the Minister of Anti-Corruption Efforts because he was not Ukrainian, and they passed a special law to allow him to come. He was already a wealthy person, and he got paid no salary, and he was going to take that. But he died before he uh, that that could happen. But we organized that. And he said in his speech, you need three things. You need to have 
someone who can speak to the public in a convincing way and, and explain, not just we're going to do these things, why they will make life better. Yeah. And you go on television and radio and, and, and explain these things. The second person is someone who knows how to assemble political coalitions. That's your really political person. The one who can say, come on, join or go, okay, okay, we'll concede this to you, but let's assemble a working majority in the parliament or Congress. And the third thing, he said, you need someone who's willing to be hated. And of he course. said, that's me. He said, everybody mm -hmm. hates me in Georgia. Uh, because he said... You're taking away their ability to be corrupt. Well, and because he said, that everyone comes and says, I want a special favor. And I say, no. And they hate me. They hate me as a consequence. He's, he's made a funny joke once. I heard him. He was a very dear person, if, if you ever want to look up a remarkable... Uh, person. He said, uh, when I'm walking to my office, and he was a very, very big man. When I say big, I mean really big, big, uh, uh, overweight, uh, obese person with a huge mustache. I mean, like the giant Georgian mustache. And um, he said, when I'm walking to my office, if someone says, good morning, I stop and I think, what did I do wrong? That person doesn't hate me. <laughs> there must be some special favor I haven't eliminated. Um, so those three are needed, not just one person. You need a team. And then very importantly, and I think uh, Egypt, uh, some of the reforms there have shown this, you need to have public engagement. I'll give you a simple example. One of the long-term harmful things governments do is to subsidize some commodity like gasoline or petrol. And yeah. Egypt had huge petrol subsidies. I think it ended up being about a quarter of the state budget was just subsidizing petrol. It was yeah. Incredibly wasteful. And it leads to uneconomic decisions. People were exporting petrol. They would buy it cheaply at the subsidized rate, just drive it to other countries, and so on. But if suddenly the government stops that, what do people do? Well, they burn down the petrol stations. Yeah as if that's going to make petrol easier to get. It doesn't. You need to have a public campaign to explain why the prices should reflect supply and demand and why we'll all be better off, even though in the short run, I don't like the fact that my petrol price just went up. In the longer run, it'll be better for everybody. Yeah. If you just do it, you're going to get pushback, riots, and anger. So you need to have an engagement with the public and actually talk to them, debate it, be on radio and television, and talk to people who want to keep the subsidy and, and debate them publicly in a fair way and get enough of the population, majority, but maybe just a critical minority to say, yeah, that's right. Even though I, I don't like the fact my petrol price is going to go up next week, I understand in the long run, it's better for the whole country not to be just pouring money down the drain with petrol subsidies. Examples of good governance. Um, I'll shut up, but uh, <laughs> still don't believe in government. Can, can I ask you a question, uh, uh, Tom? So, so overall, uh, if you look down 10 years, let's say 2035, uh, do you think we'll have more liberties or less? Can I return very quickly and say one last thing about your previous question mm. about government? I'm not a, a good government person in the sense I think government can do wonderful things all the time. I believe in limited government, limited to a narrow range of activities, and then watch it like Smokey the Bear in the American car commercials you're, you have to watch that campfire all the time and put it out, make sure it doesn't spread. And government is like that. It's very dangerous. Yeah. The other element is, in some ways, much of our lives, we govern ourselves. In a, in a certain sense, anarchy, in the sense of no government, is just all around us. Whenever people organize themselves without having a, a dictator Correct. telling that, them what That is do, a kind of government I would I would support. Well, 
my own view, and I've written on this topic in academic papers and history journals and uh, 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 documents and so on, is we have seen stateless societies, and we may see them again, that function at a high level. Yeah. In a certain sense, every time people organize themselves without a command, that's what it is. We live in that world already. Government doesn't consume all of our relations. But it is there. I believe in it in that sense that it exists. And I want to minimize the harm it can do. And when it can do something good, direct it to that limited sphere. But now then, you're, th this deep question, is the world going to become freer or less free in the future? I have to admit, I'm a longer-term optimist. Amazing. Th these have been uh, hard times in recent years. We have seen the reemergence of a scary dictatorship in China and in Russia uh, and aggressive expansionism on the part of these powers. We've seen systematic information attacks through disinformation uh, on freer societies and disruption of democratic processes by the proliferation of multiple false narratives, all from the same source. That's how they do it. Peter Pomerantsev has written has studied this very carefully and written extensively on how the Russian state does this. They don't say one lie, they say 17 lies in four minutes. Mm. And then you say, I don't know how what's true anymore. Yeah. Right. So we've we are going through a difficult time. I think this is a pivotal time, pivotal moment, uh, certainly in my lifetime. Uh, but I'm a long run optimist. And for two reasons. One is I think that free societies are more resilient than the advocates of dictatorship think. And second, pessimism is self-fulfilling. If you want to have a good outcome, be optimistic. Just do the best that you can in the hope that things are going to get better. So I believe in optimism in that sense. And then the third point I would make Looking at the last 225 or so years, for much of humanity, which means the overwhelming majority, life has gotten a little bit better. There have been downtimes, right. many people and so on. Uh, Steven Pinker in his book on Enlightenment Now, I think, uh, does a marvelous job on this. Uh, the website humanprogress.org documents this in great detail across a huge range of experiences, life has gotten better. Life has got, and it's connected not just to having more stuff, more washing machines. I'm a big fan of washing machines compared to hand washing. Uh, my mother had the, the crank thing. <laughs> I didn't uh, remember that, yeah. When, when I was a little boy, she was clever enough to make me consider it a cool thing to be allowed to crank it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But um, now we don't have that anymore. I have a machine. I just pop things in, push the buttons. It's all computer. It has its, it has its own Wi-Fi. It's astonishing. Life's gotten better, and I think it will continue to do that. But I do think that we also need to take a self-aware stance on behalf of liberty. And here's the hardest thing to do. Not just my freedom, but yours. Everyone's everyone's that is Every it for me yeah by, by me taking away your freedom i'm setting an environment where i allow my own freedom to be taken away by you oh absolutely bingo but there's is even a deep psychological level so that's a kind of risk analysis um it's the useful idiots who create dictatorships and they're the first ones lined up against the wall and executed just mm. it, it's happened so many times and you yeah. think like why can't they understand this um, but there's a psychological level also. One of my figures that I really admire was a man named Joaquim Nabucco, who was Brazilian. He was an abolitionist. He worked all his life from being a student until success in 1888 to eliminate slavery in Brazil. He said it was unbearable that here he was a, a free person, but he said what was unbearable was to live in a society when other people are not free. And in his book on abolitionism, which had a big impact at swaying the opinion to get rid of this evil institution, 
he wrote something I've committed almost to memory. He said, educate yourselves and educate your children and the love of the freedom of others. For only when you love the freedom of other people will you truly appreciate your own. You will not see it as a gratuitous gift from fate, but you will truly appreciate and embrace it. And that I've taken as my personal motto. I mentioned I don't smoke marijuana. I don't, I don't even like being around it at all. But I've worked for 50 years to legalize it. Not because I want to smoke it, but because I think it's wrong to put other people in cages. Yeah. I don't have to be a member of this religious group or that sexual minority to favor their equal freedom. That's, their freedom is connected to mine at a deep, deep level. That's it. We end there. I think that truly in my mind, if, if you value your freedom, learn to believe in the freedom of others. I think that truly to me is a world changing societal uh, uh, direction that actually delivers on everyone's freedom. Tom, I am so grateful. I am, I'm more educated, but also so, uh, uh, so connected to your views and your actions and your activities. It's so kind of you to share your time. It really is a lovely conversation. I'm, you sort of tempted me to, to sort of follow politics a little more, uh, because you, look at it from a loving way, a, 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 um, an empowering way. I'm, I'm so grateful for your time. I'm so grateful for this conversation. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. It's been a real delight. And uh, you've given me a lot to think about in the coming days and months. Thank you. Oh, I, I, okay, that's an honor. I mean, in a very interesting way, I, I think the most useful uh, uh, reflection you can get is from someone who's completely ignorant about the topic. Thank you for uh, for allowing me to show my, what I don't know. And thank you all for, uh, for being part of this. Uh, as I always tell you, it's my biggest, biggest joy to have a guest uh, uh, that I can learn from here, which is almost every guest, but so many, so, so much variety because of you listening to Slow Mo. Uh, tell me if you want me to have more conversations on such topics. Uh, at the end of the day, I think we closed at what I believe in my heart is a world changer. If you want your own freedom, believe in the freedom of others. This to me is the core of everything, really. If you want to be treated ethically, uh, treat others with ethics. Remember that the next time you uh, comment rudely on someone or hatefully on someone's comment on social media, uh, because yeah, if you take away their freedom, you're taking away uh, your freedom in, at, the, at the same time. Uh, and while you're there on social media, why don't you just uh, post about this podcast and tell people that you like it, uh, perhaps uh, go to your podcast player and uh, rate this five star. Uh, go to YouTube, watch our video content now, uh, and uh, yeah, and um, sub, you know, subscribe uh, and uh, share and all of that lovely stuff that we do on social media. Uh, your support will help me grow this podcast, and as you do, uh, it will help me get more of those interesting conversations. Uh, whatever you do this week, uh, uh, take a little bit of time to slow down and reflect because it doesn't matter how busy you are. There is always a little bit of time to slow down. I love you all for listening and I will see you next time. <laughs>